Would you stand with me for a few seconds? And let's sing a song together. <clears throat> sing the 133rd Psalm. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren. God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past. I thank God he doesn't speak like that anymore. It's not sundry times, once in a while, this way or that way, divers manners, and it's not in the past anymore. He's speaking to us continuously now, constantly. But in times past, he spake unto the fathers, not to everyone, but he spake unto the fathers, and he spake unto them by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Jesus Christ is not the heir by default. He was appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. My sermon is about Jesus, the brightness of God's glory. I want to read that phrase from some other versions of the Bible. The NIV says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. The American Standard says, Who being the effulgence of His glory and the very image of His substance. I particularly like that one. The Revised Standard said, He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of His nature. The New Century Version, the sun reflects the glory of God and shows exactly what God is like. New American Standard says, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Young's Literal Translation says, who being the brightness of the glory and the impress of his subsistence. This is a very weighty matter. When I saw the uh, list of potential sermon topics. Those of you that preach, you know, a lot of times you look through that list and, and usually one of them just kind of jumps out at you and you say, that's the one I want to preach. And this was like that. And uh, I was, uh, and still am looking forward to preaching on this subject. But then after I chose that and got to thinking about it, I thought this is a, a very large subject. It's a very weighty matter. And I'll be honest with you, brethren, I feel very inadequate to speak about this. After all, I, I had to be saved from my own self. Someone had to bear my sins and take my iniquities away. And I feel uh, very inadequate to, to thoroughly expound this subject about Jesus being the brightness of God's glory. A lot of the times, the, the things that we have in our hearts, the glow that we have in our hearts is very difficult to put into words. And this subject is like that. But notice here in our text, this letter of the Hebrews begins with the main subject, and that is God. 
It is God that spoke by the prophets in time past. It is God that is speaking to us now through his Son. It is God who appointed his Son heir of all things. It is God that made the world through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. And he sat down on the right hand of God. All things are of God, 2 Corinthians 5.18 tells us. And he is the one with whom we have to do. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. The creation of the universe and all the personalities that are in it, the saga of the human race, heaven and hell, all these things are of him. This is God's stage. This is his account. He is the main person. The eyes of all creation are upon God to see what he will do and what he will say. It's not all about the human race. It's not all about what we did or what we need or what we want. It's not even all about the church. It's not even all about saving souls. I'm not trying to diminish those things, but when you want to say, what's it all about? It's not all about that. It's all about God and the glory of God. That's, that's as high as you can get, is the glory of God. All these other matters are just a part of his purpose. So when the trumpet sounds and the angel declares that time shall be no more, when the earth is reaped and the dead are raised and we're brought into the presence of God, we'll know then it will be very obvious that he is the one with whom we have to do. You know, if Jesus Christ himself prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, and nevertheless not my will but thine be done, and if he also said, I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now if Jesus, the only begotten of the Father, said that, then we have been duly informed that all of this is of God, that the work of God and of the Father. How utterly foolish is the man that thinks that he can do God a favor. And I have seen many that think that, that embark on something that they think that they're going to do God a favor or that they're going to help out God. Well, how ridiculous. God's not just an ancient idea that men have conjured up, but God is the maker of man. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thy throne is established of old. Before there were heavens, before there was an earth, or a sun, or any stars or planets, before there was an angel, there was God, and the Word, and the Holy Spirit. He is the I am that I am. He is the Almighty God. He is the only and all-wise God. All power belongs to Him. He is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. He forgives all manner of iniquity and transgression and sin, and He will not acquit the guilty. He is also willing to show His wrath, for He is a consuming fire. His counsel is immutable, and He changes not. God is the creator. God is not a man. He is just and holy and righteous. God has a kingdom and he is glorious. He has honor and strength and blessing. He is a provider and a giver and he is love. God is a jealous God and he revengeth and is furious. And he is mighty and terrible and he is also a refuge. God is judge himself, and he is a helper and a defense. God is a God of salvation, and he is a shield. The Lord our God is one Lord, and God is a spirit. God is faithful and true, and in him is light, and there is no darkness at all. Amen. Now God is all of these things and much more, and in abundance. But who knew it? No one knew it. He's revealing these things to us. <clears throat> so he set out to reveal himself, and the first thing he did was to create some personalities for him to reveal himself to. The scriptures tell us that God maketh his angels 
and his ministers a flame of fire, and that the angels are great in power and might. In fact, they are so glorious a creation that one of them, named Lucifer, thought that he might ascend into heaven and up above the throne of God and be like the Most High. Now the angels serve God and are in his presence, so they know of his glory and his righteousness and his holiness and his power, and they've seen his wrath. But they knew nothing of grace or mercy or long-suffering. So God's grand project is just underway. He now has an arch enemy who is powerful and who is cunning and who has also a great host of evil helpers. The scriptures tell us that he took the third part of the heavenly host with him. And how better for God to display his glory than in the midst of conflict. All, I've, I've made note of this that all the speakers that have come before me, they've all said the same thing in their own way, and I'm going to say it to you too. That Now all of us here, we want to glorify God. I want to glorify God. I pray this very regularly to, for God to use me to glorify His name. But now I can tell you, as, as has already been said, that this is not always going to be easy. There are, you know, a lot of we can, we can do good deeds before men, good works, that they may see them and glorify our Father in heaven. And I certainly don't diminish that, that God wants us to do that, and we want to do that, and God glorifies his name through that. But there's other times where God's glorifying his name, and you're just kind of along for the ride. And, and it, all you can do is keep the faith and not sin. That's about all you can do. But, but God glorifies himself through us. So it's in the midst of conflict. See, this is how God reveals who he is. This is how God reveals what he can do. It's in the midst of conflict and weakness. So God began by displaying to all these personalities that he had created. And, there, and this is an area that I, I certainly don't have knowledge in. There may be other, there are other personalities in heaven. You know, the book of the Revelation talks about there being creatures before the throne and 24 elders. I, I know nothing of these other than the fact the scriptures tell us they're there. But God's revealing himself to the principalities and powers that are in heavenly places. Now, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What a glorious creation it was. He spoke and there was light. And he spoke the firmament of the sky into existence, and the dry land, and the seas. He spoke in all manner of green growing things that bore seeds grew upon the earth. He spoke the planets, and the sun, and the moon into order, so that they would determine day and night, and signs, seasons, days, and years. He filled the seas with all manner of life, and the skies with all manner of fowl. He spoke, and the cattle and all creatures that roam on the land came into existence. The heavenly hosts saw all of this. They saw that God fastened the foundations of the earth and laid the cornerstone, and they sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. Boy, this was glorious. You know, no, no man got to see this, but they saw it. God had revealed something to them about himself that they had not seen before. But now we're just getting started. The greater part of God has yet to be revealed. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here in this special creation, God was going to reveal himself in ways that no created personality had ever seen before or ever imagined. Only in this creation could his person, his glory, be displayed more fully. Adam and Eve nor the holy angels could have possibly conceived that through man the brightness of God's glory would be revealed. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? that thou art mindful of him. Or the son of man, that thou visitest him, thou madest him a little lower than the angels, and yet thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. 
God blessed Adam and Eve, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Here in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, a course was set, the groundwork was laid, the stage was set for God's great work of revealing himself. Here in the garden, sin entered in through Adam, who is the father of the human race. Here Adam was cursed, Eve was cursed, the serpent was cursed. Here man was cut off from God, and the doom of death, <clears throat> pardon me, a spiritual death entered in. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now Adam had a great start being created in the image of God. He had everything there provided for him in the garden. It was all ready. But Satan went to work as soon as he could. So right off the bat, Adam, the head of the human race, plunges headlong into sin and alienation from God. Thus every human born after him has the same carnal, sinful, and rebellious nature so severe was the situation that the Holy Spirit tells us that death reigned over the human race. There is a kingdom called death, and all who are born in it are sinners. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, what's he going to do with man who was created lower than the angels? How is God going to reveal his glory through a race of alienated sinners and living under the rule of death? God's wisdom is so great that even he announces what he is going to do to the serpent, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now only God can announce his plans to the enemy, and even thousands of years in advance, Gave Satan plenty of time to do something about this. Go ahead, try to stop me. Now, let's not lose the promise, the wonder of this promise that he made. Sin alienates us from God, it alienated all men from God. Puts the sinner in a position where he is cut off from divine blessings and benefits. But God's, God's instructions to Adam were, But of the tree of knowledge and good of, of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. In the tabernacle service, you know, this, everything that happened in the tabernacle was because of sin. All those offerings and sacrifices, all that blood being shed and being sprinkled, the garments the priest wore, the duties that they had to perform, this was all dealing with sin. All dealing with this issue of how to get sinful man into the presence of God and how to get, get us in a position where God can bless us, where God can dwell with sinful man. That's what the tabernacle was dealing with. So sin is a very great matter of weight. It erected a great barrier between God and man, represented by the veil in the tabernacle. It was a barrier that no man could remove or permeate. <clears throat> death reigned from Adam to Moses. But does that mean that after Moses, death no longer reigned? No. Sin continued and death continued after Moses. But the law was given by Moses. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. What was God doing by giving the law? He was actually allowing the sins of men to pile up. He was convicting men of their sin, showing them that they were sinners, but he was also allowing this conflict to raise. He was, we would say he was raising the bar. He was allowing these to pile up because he's going to reveal something about himself. The law entered that the offense might abound, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, 
whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth might be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. Amen. All right, now we have the perfect environment for God to glorify his name. There has been a mighty angel fall from heaven and take the third part of the angelic host with him. God's next highest creation, mankind, has also fallen into sin. Every one of them born into death and dominated by their sinful natures, of which the devil takes full advantage. To make the situation even more hopeless, God gave his holy law, which served to condemn every man, since there is not a one who could keep it. And the sins are piling up, and the human race continues to go down. In this time, light is very scarce. This is the time where God spoke in divers' manners at sundry times. But the great conflict continues to grow greater. Seems like the veil between the people and God, the veil over the most holy place, gets thicker. The only reason that God tolerated this situation is because he knew what he was going to do. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the word, world. And actually, you know, tolerated is not the right word to use. The scriptures use the words forbearance. He was forbearing of sin. The reason he didn't destroy the whole human race is because he wants to show his glory. He was forbearing until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Amen. I remember the first time I heard this text in Jeremiah chapter 9. It's my father, Brother Given, preached this. I was still in my teens. But let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. I remember when I first heard that, I could hardly believe that was in the Bible. That God actually said he wanted to be known, that men should glory in this, that they know me. And even more amazing, it was in the Old Testament scriptures that God said this. That he exercises righteousness and judgment and loving kindness in the earth. Amen. Now the prophets were not quiet about this. God let them know what he was going to do and they proclaimed it faithfully. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people." And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, saying, Know ye the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, <clears throat> and I will remember their sin no more. You know, the prophets spoke these things, and we know that they, they could not fully comprehend what was coming out of their own mouths. How in the world was God going to do this? Put laws in people's hearts so that it would not depart from them. Forgive sins. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light. The Gentiles and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Amen. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. <clears throat> and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek." and his rest shall be glorious. 
And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy people also shall be all, all of them, righteous. Amen. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Amen. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified before of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. <clears throat> he was revealing these things to heavenly principalities and powers. And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. No matter how many times I hear this, it still amazes me that the Word became flesh. An amazing consideration. And dwelt among us. Here's, God, here's again God's revealing His glory. Who, who in heaven, who among the angels would have ever thought that God would condescend and become flesh? My goodness. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Amen. What did this man come to do? He came to destroy the devil and to reveal the kingdom of God. Now, this was very puzzling to many people. A man, God sends a man to glorify his name. To fill, fulfill all these prophecies, he sends a man born of a woman. He, ha he doesn't even have any form or comeliness that we should desire him. He has no political clout. He doesn't even have a place of his own to stay in. How can such a glorious thing happen through such a weak man? Where is his army at? The principalities and powers in heavenly places are looking on to see what God is going to do. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, those which were lunatic, those that had the palsy, and he healed them. 
And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. <clears throat> He's revealing the glory of God. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. What do you want to learn about God? What did you see in Jesus? I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden light. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. I like this account in Luke 4, where there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he began to say unto them, This day... Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Praise the Lord. We beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what was Jesus doing in all this? He was revealing the glory of God. See, now there were some men that couldn't see it. Matter of fact, most men couldn't see it. But that's, that's the way God reveals his glory. It's not always right on the surface where you can see it. There, you know, there's... The greater part of God's glory, no one has seen yet. We won't see that until the end. Amen. He was full of grace and truth. He was compassionate. He preferred mercy over sacrifices. He expounded the kingdom of God. He was intolerant of hypocrites, legalists, and those whose business was in the trading of men's souls. But this is not all that Jesus did to glorify God his Father. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Peace costs something. It cost a punishment for sins. Our chastisement fell on him, and with his stripes we are healed. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. Glory out of affliction. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And Paul said in the Hebrews, but now once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now what happened here? 
him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have slain and crucified. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. This is how God glorified his name. In these things he displayed his great wisdom to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. In this man, this weak man, this weak homeless man, who gave up his own life, God is showing things about himself that could not otherwise be seen. They had to be demonstrated and worked out before the eyes of men and angels. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What's he saying? That God may be glorified through me. Therefore I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong." For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. That's not, this the story's not over yet, brethren. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel, and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you Amen. and to take away, turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Amen. So we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son this day have I begotten thee. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, Amen. from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through this flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. We are buried with him by baptism, in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. See, God's operating. Baptism it just isn't just something you do. It's the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. I like that. He openly humiliated them. He humiliated the devil. 
The devil thought he was winning, and God was winning all along. He was revealing his glory. I love that. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit. <clears throat> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, <clears throat> not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, because he's going to give you glory too. Which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. And what about those Gentiles? But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, Amen. so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. What about that serpent to whom God spoke in the garden? For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, Amen. and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, it's no small matter when the Holy Spirit tells us that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. Pay attention to when he says this. He could have said this in Genesis chapter 1, when God created the world through Jesus Christ, but he didn't. He could have said it in John chapter 1 when he says that the Word was in the beginning, then the Word was with God, and the Word was God, but he didn't. The Spirit could have made this statement when Jesus was born, and all the angels shouted for joy and praised God and worshipped him, but he didn't. It's here in the book of the Hebrews, a book that expounds the accomplishments and the great high priesthood of Jesus. It's here that we read that when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, it is here in this place that the Holy Spirit says he is the brightness of God's glory. He crushed the serpent's head. He destroyed him that had the power of death. He took the veil out of the way. He became the father of a new race of people. He freed us from the curse of the law. He revealed the Father. He justified God's forbearance of sins. He made the way for God to write his laws in our inward parts and put them in our hearts. He bound the strong man and spoiled his house. He delivered the captives. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. He justified many. He's made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He made peace through the blood of his cross. He reconciled all things to God. He took away sins. He spoiled principalities and powers. He destroyed the works of the devil. He made us new creations. He gave us power to become the sons of God. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, the brightness of God's glory. Having done all these things and more, the Holy Spirit tells us that he's the brightness of God's glory. What marvelous wisdom God has displayed on this stage called earth. But now Christ's work is nowhere near finished yet. Now that he has ascended on high, there are things about God that are still being revealed that could not otherwise be seen. The angels are still looking into these things while God demonstrates that his strength is made perfect in weakness. 
they are beholding how that God can make consolation abound at the same time sufferings abound and that glory follows suffering they are seeing that the manifold wisdom of God through the church they behold Satan pardon me they behold as men and women mere mortals <clears throat> and Adam's fallen offspring who were once in bondage to Satan and taken captive at his will are now equipped with the armor of God and wrestling against principalities and powers against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places for we walk for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ how is all of this possible because Christ Jesus by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high <clears throat> of all that God has said and done nothing reveals his glory nothing reveals his person more than his forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith now that righteousness of God has been revealed that's a righteousness that God has for you <clears throat> It is the exclusive wisdom and power that God has to be both just and justifier. Amen. Christ, the brightness of God's glory. Amen. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. God blessed forever. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen God blessed forever amen. and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth he is God blessed forever for in that he died he died unto sin once but in that he liveth he liveth unto God God blessed forever for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ God blessed forever unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end he is God blessed forever Amen. being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God God blessed forever Amen. and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father he is God blessed forever for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased he is God blessed forever Amen. and the city had no need of the Sun neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof God blessed forever to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever God blessed forever. Amen. Amen.